Hi, this is Jack Stanley, and I wanted to talk about recording horns, acoustic recording horns. You know, we, we often talk about acoustic recording, but we never, ever talk much about the horns that were used. You know, there was a myriad of horns used. It's really incredible. When I look at the, when I went to the Eldridge Johnson a Museum in Delaware, I, they had a lot of the recording horns that were used at Victor there, and it's fascinating to look at. Of course, with the Edison Company, many of their recording horns are still existent, and it's interesting to look at them. And I remember looking at so many different types of horns that were used but in all of these horns, there was a major issue. They were extremely directional. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is that the recording horn was shaped like this and would open with a bell about yay big. Not much bigger, usually. There were some larger ones that were used for orchestras. But the fact is that the recording radius of that horn to make the best sound was within that triangle created by the shape of that horn. If you were beyond it, you weren't recorded well. And if you're a little bit further beyond it, you weren't recorded at all. This is very important because we forget the fact of how difficult it was to make an acoustic recording. We are looking at something that is so amazingly distant. Our entire recording industry has nothing in common with what is, was done then. And if you think about it, those recording sessions that were done for Columbia or Victor or Edison or Brunswick or whomever had to be carefully controlled because if they were not carefully controlled and put within the proper constriction, the recording itself would be flawed. The singer wouldn't come out right. The musical instruments wouldn't come out right. Or if it was a speaker by themselves, they had to be at the horn. There was no being a distance away. There was no way to make an on-the-spot recording of someone outside speaking unless the phonograph horn was directly in their face which wouldn't make for a good speech. This totally tears apart many of these on-the-spot recordings that were made in the 1890s because people don't realize. Now, I want to give you some photographic examples. Now, in my career, I have been fortunate to have made about 300 acoustic recordings. In fact, before the Victor talking machine turned 100 years of age, we had a ceremony in Camden, New Jersey, at where the plant had been, and we made the first acoustic recording in Camden since 1925. And that was done in the year 2001, in the summer of 2001. It was a pretty amazing and historic event. And I had all of the people involved make a recording, and it was presented to their museum. It was really kind of cool. And I was very glad and very happy to be a part of celebrating the 100 years of the Victor Talking Machine Company. Now, there may be photographs of that event. I have one photograph of everyone standing by the machine. But I want to give you some examples here, if I may. I put a few photographs out to let you see what I am talking about. Now, 
Uh, I have talked before about some of these recordings that were made with a cheering mob. Now, if you think about the fact that the horn was directional and the speaker had to speak within the horn, that would mean that the cheering mob that would be well recorded had to be behind the speaker. They couldn't be in the audience. I did experiments with that too. In the 1980s, I did some stage performances in which we made acoustic recordings. And I sang, someone else would sing, we would fiddle and talk, and then I would have the audience yell and scream and do this, and it was minute. There was hardly a sound. You could hear it, yes, but it was not very loud. It was basically one-tenth the volume of what we were creating. Um, to have cheers behind you, actually, this is a recording that was made with one of these events, I had the radio and television personality, Joe Franklin, make a cylinder recording, and there was a cheering crowd behind him. And that's the way we could have a cheering crowd. Here's a photograph of it, just to give some photographic evidence. As you can see, he is speaking into the horn, and behind him are the people that are going to cheer. This is... Uh, a close-up of Robert Merrill, the operatic baritone, making a cylinder recording for me. And you can see he's right up to that horn. He needs to be. That's how you made a recording. Um, you had to prepare it. I have talked about this before with Gerald Ford, President Gerald Ford. This is him right here, speaking into a recording horn. I'm holding his speech for him. Yes, I was a lot younger then. But he has to be right up to that horn because it is so amazingly directional. That's important. And I wanted to give some evidence to this because I keep hearing about these various recordings by whomever it may be and the cheering crowds and everything else. That ain't going to happen. The cheering crowd has to be behind the speaker. And therefore, it is not a legitimate speech. It is a studio recording. And in that case, more often than not, it wasn't the individual who gave the speech originally. Now, a couple of other things to mention here, because I really want to talk about the fact of how that horn ruled the recording studio. Everything dealt with the horn. You know, they discovered when Edison developed the 125-foot horn, they discovered it was ridiculously directional. And they had a little window of area where they could work. And even though they had numbered various numbers on the floor of the Columbia Street Studio, most of the recordings didn't work well, and they had to be within what you might call the sweet zone of the horn. Most recordings made had to be made in the sweet zone. And when someone would perform, when someone would sing, they had to be within 12 inches at, at, at most away from that horn, vocalist. Now, there are exceptions. There were singers that would be much further back, uh, operatic singers, they needed more space. They were incredibly powerful and loud. There are recording sessions in which they had Enrico Caruso in the latter part of his life when he got a little bit hooty in the sound because sometimes he would let out with these loud gasps at times and they had him back about four to six feet and it worked because it balanced out with the other singers. But early in his career, he was much closer to the horn. But he became, his voice got much darker. It got much more powerful and much more pushy. And he would, uh, had some extra sounds that he made sometimes with the voice toward the end of his career. Uh, other singers, Henry Burr and Billy Murray, Irvin Coffin, they were right up to the horn. 
That was how it worked. This is very, very important to understand, that no matter what you did, no matter who it was, no matter what the occasion or where it may be, the horn was the, the ruler, the dictator, the executioner, the judge. It was everything, because you could not make a good recording unless the horn was satisfied. So I wanted to mention this, because when you listen to recordings made by Victor Columbia, whomever, all of the singers all of the orchestra, or just the piano, everything had to be within earshot of that horn. And we forget that fact. And when we see historic programs where they say this is the actual voice of blah 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 doing a speech, one thing that drives me crazy is the on YouTube there's a recording of William McKinley stated by the Smithsonian that it is William McKinley. Now, nobody knows what William McKinley exactly sounded like. But we do know he was from Ohio. And someone from Ohio will have a slight accent. If you listen to William Howard Taft, if you listen to Warren G. Harding, who made recordings, who were from Ohio, you can hear a regional dialect. There is no reason in the world why William McKinley did not have the same. And also, on the recording, has a cheering crowd. Now we know the horn is directional. See, the problem is that we deal with people who are studying this who have no understanding of the process on how they were recorded. Therefore, we're dealing with 120-year-old technology that is not clearly understood. This is the problem that we often have with early acoustic recording. Recordings were made to satisfy the horn. There is no other part to a recording. You had to work within the limits of the horn. Hey, there's other things I can mention. I, I know from my experience making like 300 acoustic recordings, I have tried various experiments, various distances, uh, it's amazing how different it changes when you move to the side. You lose everything. A lot of times they can have fade-in and fade-out areas of recordings. You'll hear it quite often. Like a troop of soldiers, what they do is they just go on the other side by the horn, and as soon as they're out of that triangle of recognition by the horn, they are just barely heard. It's an interesting thing that we don't truly think of. But I can tell you from experience, um, having done this, probably as much as anyone who is alive today, and probably equaling with several people that aren't alive today, that acoustic recording requires um, a close encounter with the individual who's going to make that record. Once we understand that, then we can look at everything that has been recorded, and when they tell us it is original, we can question the fact. Walt Whitman, he could barely speak toward the end of his life and had trouble breathing. How do you make an acoustic recording? Ain't gonna happen. Sorry to say that, but uh, I don't believe that that's original at all. I think the Walt Whitman cylinders are fakes. And one other thing to mention to you, in the earliest days of recording, if someone of note was going to make a record, they would announce their name, because it was prestigious. And there's where I have the issue with the McKinley recording, that there is no announcement. And that makes me worry. Same thing, there's a recording of Grover Cleveland on there. That's not Grover Cleveland. That's, that's a recording artist. It could have been Len Spencer or, or uh, Harry Spencer or one of the individuals at that time with a cheering crowd behind them recorded in the studio, as rudimentary as it may be. So these are the things we have to look out for and think of when it comes to acoustic recording. The horn was the ruler of all. And we 
worked our way around it. So that's my little talk on acoustic recording. There's a lot more to mention. Good God. I hope someday I can get a table of individuals and let us all talk and share the experience in which we have been involved and put this down so it would be preserved for future generations. Because this information is not usually available to people. People don't know about this. And I think it is extremely important for those who collect and those who research the history of sound recording. Thank you.